Chapel. Welcome to Chapel. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol the Lord, all peoples. The Lord's steadfast love towards us is great. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. He answered, eh, No. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, The first. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. Hi, my name is Robert Brewer. I'm the chaplain here at Greensboro College. Thank you for joining us this week for online chapel worship. Uh, this week I'm uh, recording this sermon from our prayer room here in our um, main building. It's on the second floor of main building, right in the center of the building, right in the center of campus. It's a place where you can come and pray, to meditate, to relax, to find some peace. If you're here on campus between uh, 8.30 to 5 on Monday through Friday, come and use it. Be here. Uh, you're welcome to be in this space. If nobody else is in here at the time, you're welcome to come in and pray or to find some peace. The scripture this week is uh, probably summed up in the phrase, actions speak louder than words. You know that phrase, probably been told that phrase sometimes. When you didn't follow up with what you were going to do or said you were going to do, you actually didn't do it. Sometimes I was told that when I said, yes, yes, I'll clean my room, and I never did. <laughs> Actions speak louder than words, right? Doing it actually is more important than what you say. This phrase in those exact words was probably first written down in the early 1700s. Actions speak louder than words. But it's been around for a long time, for centuries. Probably people know that doing the thing is more important than just talking about it. Even Jesus was all about getting his disciples to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. Do it, not just speak about it. And so that's what it seems like this parable is all about today. There is a father who has two sons. He goes to both of them to ask them to do some work. The first one he says, hey, well, I need you to work in the vineyard. And that son says, no, I'm not doing it. But then a little while later, that son goes ahead and does the work. The second son he comes to, the father says, will you work in the vineyard? And the second son says, sure, yes, sir, I will go. I'll do it. I'll work in the vineyard. But then he never does it. So Jesus asked the people, which one of it, these two sons, actually did the work and the will of the father? Of course, it's the first one, the first one, they say. The first one who first said no, but then actually went and did it. That's the one who did the will of the father. So it seems like Jesus is trying to get his disciples to actually do the work. But if you look a little closer at this parable, I think there's something more to it. That Jesus is trying to say something a little bit more than just do the work. Because in Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, he lived in a culture where shame and honor was a really important concept. As the scholar Cynthia Jarvis points out, that shame and honor in this culture really can play a part of this parable. Because if you listen to the parable in the culture of shame and honor, it becomes a little bit deeper, a little bit richer, a little bit stronger. The parable of the two sons becomes a little bit more dramatic. Because the first son, when he says no, is actually being a shameful son. He's not obeying his father, right? He's not honoring his father because he's saying no to his father's ask and will and command. He's saying no to his father, which is a shameful thing to do. 
but he goes later and still does the work. The second son, the second son is actually being honorable because he says to his father, yes, I will go, sir. Remember, he says, sir, he's being an honorable person. He's honoring his father. I will go, sir. But then he doesn't do it. And so Jesus is saying, which one does the will of the father? Of course, it's the first one, the first one. But the first one is bringing shame to the father. The first one is acting in a shameful way. The first one is not one who is honorable or righteous. The first one is shameful. And yet that one is doing the will of the Father. I think what Jesus is trying to say in this parable is that sometimes the people who seem most shameful, most disrespectful, most um, unlikable or unlovable can sometimes be the people who actually do the will of God. That they're sometimes the people who do the will of the Father. And then he drives home the point. He says, he says, tax collectors and prostitutes are the people who will get into the kingdom of heaven before you. <laughs> Tax collectors and prostitutes certainly are not honorable positions or places of high esteem, right? But Jesus says those are the people that will get into the kingdom ahead of those who seem like they're righteous and honorable and true. I think this is the point Jesus is trying to make. That the people we seem to be the least likely to be religious to be the least likely to be the ones who do the will of the Father can actually be the ones who do the will of God. They can actually be the ones who are honoring the Father, even though they might seem to be shameful. I think Jesus is saying that those who occupy a place of shame in this world, in this culture, can be the very ones who fulfill the God's will and fulfill God's purpose and kingdom here on earth. And those who sometimes hold the most honorable places may not be doing the will of the Father at all. Jesus is really making a radical statement here. <laughs> it's really radical because Jesus is saying, those people you think are religious, those people you think who are following the way of the commandments and the laws, those people who say yes all the time, those people may actually not be doing the will of the Father. But the people who seem to be the least, the last, the lost, the unlucky, the shame, uh, shameful people in this world, those are the ones who are doing the will of the Father. This has been Jesus' mission in the gospel all along anyway, because Jesus has come to bring a gospel to the people who feel the most shamed in this world, who feel the least likely to be loved in this world, that God is bringing into this place a place of honor for those who feel lost, a place of honor for those who feel shamed, that God's making a place for people who have no place, that God's making a kingdom for those who have no kingdom, that God is giving a place of honor to those who feel ashamed in this world. And Jesus does this with his life, with his very life, because Jesus dies upon a cross, which is the most shameful thing to do in Jesus's culture. A cross is not a place of honor. It is a place of ridicule and shame. And Jesus is going there. Jesus goes there. Jesus is on a place of shame so that those people in this world who feel shamed who feel shameful, who feel like they are least loved, who feel like they are ridiculed, who feel like they are being ostracized and hurt, will know that that is where Jesus goes as well. That Jesus' mission is to be in the places of shame and hurt and pain in this world so that those who are in those places of shame and hurt and pain can be set free can be given a place of love, of life, and honor. Brene Brown says, we live in a culture of shame. 
We live in a culture where people are shamed all the time. We're shamed for who we are. We feel shame because we feel like we're not loved. We feel shame because we feel like we're not good enough. We feel shame because of things that have been happening or done to us. People feel shame because of who they love or who they are. People feel shame because they're different than others. People feel shame because they can't quite fit in. People feel shame because they do not feel like anyone would love them, not even God. But the good news is that God is not ashamed of you or of me or of anyone in this world. And that God resides in those places where we feel the most shameful and infuses those places with love and mercy and forgiveness and grace so that that shame that you might feel in your life cannot have power over you anymore. God is coming and desires to come to make a place for you in God's kingdom, at God's table, so that you do not feel isolated or excluded or pushed out because of who you are. You are honored in God's love and life because God goes to the places of shame in this world to transform them, to overcome them, to give you a place of forgiveness and peace. Actions speak louder than words, my friends. And the actions of Jesus in this world speak volumes because Jesus is willing to go to the places of this world to know, to show you that you are loved, to show you that you are cared for, to show you that you belong in God's kingdom. And no amount of shame, no amount of ridicule, no amount of difference can separate you or take you away from God's love. I think this is what the parable is all about. There are people in this world who are often the least likely people to be doing the work of the kingdom of God. Maybe that's you. Maybe you are doing God's work and God's will. It may not look like the righteous. It may not look like the honorable. It might not look like those who have it all together. But maybe in your way, in your life, in your way of being of who you are, you are doing the will of the Father. You are doing the work of the kingdom. Because certainly that's where you belong. Let us pray. Like a deer that pants for the water, so our souls long after you, O God. 
we come this day to bring ourselves to you, our worry, our anxiety, our fear, so that we might have your peace. Today we pray for those who live with shame and guilt. May they know your forgiveness. We pray for those who are lonely and isolated. May they know your presence and peace. We pray for those who are sick and ill and who suffer from disease. May they know your comfort and healing. We pray for all those who long for freedom and justice to come. And we pray for your peace and grace and kingdom to be here on earth, O God. Surround us with your love, transform us, renew us, and set us free to live as your people. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey everybody, I just have a few quick announcements. Today is National Play-Doh Day, so make sure you stop by outside the cab uh, to pick up your little jar of Play-Doh. Also, tonight UAAS is meeting. They'll be set up outside the cab also um, sometime this evening, and they'll be meeting at 7.30 on Zoom. Cream also meets tonight on Zoom. And next week, uh, Monday at 8, FCA meets on Zoom. And also next week is homecoming week, so make sure to stay tuned for all the activities and announcements what's going to happen next week. And everybody have a good weekend. My friends, may you go from this place knowing that the peace of God goes with you and that God's love will never leave you nor forsake you. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit into this world to give you peace. Amen.